Hello, this is National Master Spencer Feingold back at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta for part three on, on, on the modern Benoni. This is going to be the final part. We're going to be looking at 792 when white plays 792, as well as variations where white plays with f3. A lot of different move orders there, so I'm not going to give a, uh, give a you know, number for that move, but uh, those will be the two variations that we focus on. And, uh, you know, the other lectures I was like preparing more stuff, but I kind of realized that probably only get through two variations. So, and this will round out basically all the main lines uh, that white can play against the Benoni. So it should be a pretty more or less complete repertoire for anybody who wants to play the Benoni. All you got to do is watch parts one through three of this, uh, of these lecture series. But um, all right, so let's take a look at the first game. We have David Navarra against Gashimov. Still focusing on Gashimov, although the next game won't be a Gashimov game. Uh, Navarra against Gashimov here from 2007. Torneo di Capodanno. Uh, I guess torneo means tournament, but my Italian, I, th I think that's Italian. I don't know any Italian, so it might be. But all right, let's take a look here. Uh, Navarra is pretty strong, of course. The rating is 26.56 at the time of this game. Oh, let's flip it, you know. What am I doing? <clears throat> Should have Black's perspective. There we go. So uh, he plays an e6 move order. And like I mentioned in the first two parts, d6 is the correct move order when they play with knight f3 here, um, as opposed to playing e takes d first. Refer to those, uh, or the, the first part, you've got to refer to that one if, if you want a more detailed explanation. g6. And as advertised, knight d2. We talked about this maneuver multiple times already in the first two parts. Knight d2 to c4. That's a great square for the knight. It gets out of the way of f4, so we can play f4, e4, and e5. And also the knight's on a good square there to attack the d-pawn. And yeah, this maneuver happens quite often anyways in this opening. So Navara is saying, I'm just going to play knight d2 right away. Get that over with get the knight there and, and target, pressure that, that d6 pawn, the Benoni pawn. Bishop g7. I used to think that knight d7 was more or less forced, but that's not true. Somebody told me that they were lying. <laughs> it happens. Knight d7, it's okay to play knight d7 first. You can totally do that, but it, it's not necessarily forced. Um, the reason that you would play knight d7 first is to answer knight c4 with knight b6 which I actually had a blitz game here um, against Yasser Sarawan. We played this position. Um, I forgot what he did. He probably moved his knight away. And he won, of course. But more people play like e4, and you know they can just transpose to the game. We'll see this position, basically this position in the game. So knight d7 is a fine move order, but it's not necessary. Bishop g7 is just as good. Uh, the reason that uh, I was taught, at least, or read in a book, I don't really know why I thought that, but the reason that it could be a problem is because of knight c4, which Navarra did not play, and it's not really a problem. So black could castle and bishop f4. This is like if white's trying to punish you for doing your move order. You know, with the knight d7 move order, we could play knight b6 like I showed, but here... We can't play knight d7. I mean, our pawn's hanging. Although you actually can play knight d7 and sack the pawn. But you don't even have to do that. You could play knight e8, which is a common maneuver that we talked about, it, again, in the first two parts. You often see knight e8 in a Benoni. It's, it's not, obviously, it's not the best square for the knight, but it's not so bad to play. It defends the pawn. It opens up the bishop, and it allows for f5. And later, we can maneuver to c7 once our pawn is securely defended which will help us prepare the b5 pawn break, a6, b5. So knight e8 is not a move that you should shy away from. It, it's pretty okay. For example, here's a, just a little example that I gave. Queen d2, b6. b6 is, is not very common to play that, but because they've already played knight c4, uh, b6 is, is pretty nice in this variation because we can just go take that knight. And there were... There were some grandmaster games here that I found. A4, bishop a6, and white generally just plays e3 here. 
sort of letting you take. Um, I, I looked at knight b5. I was a little bit concerned about that move personally when I was analyzing this. But it's not so bad. We can just take it and even play knight d7. Even though it looks like it hangs the pawn, if you take it, which you probably shouldn't, and takes back, and then rook e8, you'll notice that white doesn't have great development. He's very far behind in, in development. It's going to take two moves to get the bishop out and then a third move to get castled. So he's basically three tempi behind because black's got everything ready to go. Not only that, but we're just going to win our pawn back by force with knight f6. There's, it's going to be basically impossible to prevent that considering your bishop's going to be hanging too. And, and e4 is hanging the e-pawn and wouldn't defend the d-pawn anyway because of the pin. So this wouldn't make any sense for white to do. White falls behind in development and doesn't even win a pawn. It's just going to lose back the pawn. So this, that would just be good for black. So white can still do this, just not take d6, play e, e3, for example. Um, it shouldn't be too much of a problem for black. But anyways, most people, because you can't take the pawn in that variation, if they get this position, white will just play e3 anyway, where we can snag the knight. And a6 is... I found some game with a6. f5 is also playable. Castles. And we could play knight d7. Uh, by the way, the point of a6 is to stop pieces from going here. We can also do this maneuver we saw in the first two parts, where we maneuver our rook over to the e-file. And we can also answer a pawn, a pawn break like a5. We could just play b5, so a5 wouldn't make any sense for white to try that anymore. And yeah, black should be pretty happy here. I mean, usually you don't want to give up the bishop pair, but as I discussed in the first two parts, black doesn't mind to trade this bishop on c8 for one of the knights um, because strategically the most important square is e5. And our bishop can't control e5 because it's a white square bishop. But the knight that was on c4 was controlling e5. So we gained more control of e5 by trading that way. And also, white wasted some theoretical time by moving the knight around and around, and then we got to trade it off. So that would be um, gaining some time for us, you know, like I said, theoretically. But yeah, black should be pretty satisfied with this position. Going to play knight e5, going to play f5, could even play, like I mentioned, knight c7, even try to play rook b8, oh, that's going to need a little preparation. Well, okay, but knight c7 protects it. And then eventually b5. So black's got the typical plans of playing f5 and b5. We see that a lot in, in, in these Benoni variations that we've already looked at. And it shouldn't be so bad to play this position. I think it's pretty okay. I wouldn't mind at all to have black here. So the moral of the story is that knight c4 is not that big of a deal. Um, I mean, it's a good maneuver for white, but it's not like black has to avoid that in order to obtain a reasonable position. Uh, black can let you do that and then just get developed normal, like, uh, like Ashimov does with bishop g7. So Navarro doesn't play knight c4 here. Navarro goes for e4 instead. Castles and bishop e2. Rook e8. I saw some games with knight a6, as well as knight d7. Knight d7 will probably transpose where knight a6 is a more unique option. I'll say I didn't really believe knight a6 too much. Um, if you really want to play it, you can look into it and, and try, to, uh, try to make it work. But the problem with knight a6 is it's a little slow. To play knight a6 to c7, is, it's a little slower than you know, knight d7, basically. So you got to be careful about wasting time in this, in this opening as black. You have to make sure that you're making every tempo count. It's pretty sharp. But maybe it's, it's somewhat playable, I guess. But I wasn't really believing it when I looked at those variations. So just focus on rook e8 here. Castles. a6. Still, you could play knight a6. Knight d7 will most likely transpose. a4. Got to stop b5, of course. And knight d7. So yeah, this is a position where black has played all the normal Benoni moves. You know, all the, the castles, got rookie. Rook e8, Fienkettle the bishop, knight d7, a6 was met by a4. Pretty standard stuff. <clears throat> and white, as well, has played in pretty normal fashion. Uh, just started this knight d2 maneuver early, 
But other than that, it looks like you know pretty similar, for example, to like A70 that we talked about in, in the first game, or the first part, rather, um, of, uh, of the series. So here White's got a few options. Uh, I looked at basically the three most common moves. Uh, F4, which is what Navarra played, and that is the most common move. And very logical, like we were saying, to control E5 and try to make that E5 pawn break. You've got to watch out for that one. Um, there are a couple of other options here. Like I, I, you can see rook A3, H3, rook E1, queen C2. Uh, queen C2 is very similar to the famous uh, Spassky-Fischer game, game 3, where Fischer played knight H5, although the position is a little bit different. They have the moves A6 and A4 inserted. <clears throat> if you took both those moves back, that would be that exact position from Game 3 of the 1972 World Championship, where um, Fischer won with Black, of course, in a famous game. Definitely, if you're a Benoni player, you should, you should look at that game anyway. And if you want to play this way against Queen C2, then, well, you should very well know that game, I, I believe, in order to understand how to play this, this position and the structure that arises after they take, of course. They're going to take it and ruin your pawn structure. And uh, it might seem very risky for black to do this, which it is. I mean, it's strategically risky. Um, it, it's not that your king is very weak, uh, because white's not really playing for kingside pressure. I mean, they played in early knight d2. They're trying to maneuver on the queen side. And they gave up the bishop pair in order to ruin your pawn structure. So that's your, your long-term compensation. Um, and yeah, you can still play similarly to... The, uh, the typical Benoni idea is trying to get in b5, of course, also an f5 pawn break, and still play moves like knight e5, and all that good stuff. But definitely check out that game, even if you're not going to play this particular way with black, um, you should definitely know that game if you're a Benoni player. If you don't want to ruin your structure, you can also play knight e5 here. I found a game knight e5, rook a3, which... Uh, Rook a3 might seem like a weird move, but not really to me because, you know, you could slide it on over uh, at a moment's notice. And I, I've played a lot of Benoni, and a lot of times you see rook a3, especially if you're going for a kingside attack. Um, so it's not so uncommon. Also, you can see this maneuver in like a, uh, a Zaitsev Rui Lopez. You'll see white play rook a3 a lot of the time. Hey, Spencer, I have, a, I have a quick question. Oh, sure. Go for it. Are you playing knight h5 because you want the trade, or are you playing knight h5 because you're threatening knife f4 and g4? Yes, knife f4 is a good idea, but I think it's mostly to get that break going. Yeah, and you don't—you just don't mind to trade. Obviously, you're not really—you're uh, not really initiating the trade because you're not like threatening the bishop until you go knight f4, I guess. But um, yeah, you don't mind to trade and get the bishop pair. And, and anyways, trading pieces is generally nice for black, as I've mentioned many times in the series, because we have a lot less space. So yeah, we don't mind to trade. But yeah, the f5 pawn break is really what it's about. You want to get that f pawn in and, and attack the center. But good question. I'm going for the f5 pawn break. Um, mm -hmm. Is it too slow to maybe go for an h6 and then knight h7 idea? That is pretty slow, <laughs> definitely. I would say that that's probably a little bit too slow. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's basically what I would say about that. It's just slower than knight h5. But uh, we will see actually the f3, uh, the f3 variation that we'll look at next that I, I inserted one of my own games in the notes. And I did play with h6 to actually play g5. So, and that was too slow also. Um, but yeah, it's, it's generally a little bit slow to be making all those moves on the king side. Yeah, and also the knight on h7 isn't very good. Right. That's true. Yeah, you'll need more time to, like knight g5, to attack the center. So you'll need to spend even another tempo to make it, make it worthwhile. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, you could play knight e5, rook a3, and g5. We talked about g5 in part two. Um, a really nice move to try to stop f4, and also gives you the g6 square for your knight if you really need it. Um, so this is a way to play as well if you don't want to play knight h5. Just try to guard the dark squares and, and get your knight on e5. 
So yeah, that's how you can handle queen c2. Um, I also looked a little bit at rook e1. I wasn't too afraid of it, personally, but uh, this is kind of a logical move. White saying that if, if I play knight c4, you're probably going to offer the trade, which I don't want. So maybe I'll go to f1 to e3 or g3, depending on the situation. And it's just a flexible move. White's saying that I might want to put my rook here to play e5 later anyway, so I'll just play rook e1. So I looked at it a bit. Knight e5, knight f1, rook b8, pretty standard looking moves. h3. This prepares f4 because otherwise we could potentially play knight g4. So now they're stopping that. And yeah, you don't want white to play f4 and then you just have to go back home. Or right, we talk about how you can't really do that um, with black, then you, you've made a mistake basically. So that's why c4 is my suggestion here. The idea being that if you play f4, which uh, I also looked at a5 by the way, if you, look, if you play f4, we'll just sack a pawn like this and play b5, which looks like a pawn sacrifice but is not a pawn sacrifice because if you take on b5, we'll give you the fork. And even if you block it with your knight, you're going to have to deal with a nasty discovered attack. And uh, this is already losing for white. Honestly, a terrible situation for white to fall into this pin and, and lose material back. And also, by the way, this is pinned, so you can't even take the knight. So this would be terrible for white. So in this position, white can't take the pawn. White is still already up a pawn. Um, but black has pretty good compensation. It has the bishop pair. Got in b5 so we could play b4. And if we do play b4, we're sort of weakening control of e4. So we're going to have good pressure against the center. And uh, we got in our pawn breaks. And we have dynamic play as well as a static advantage of the bishop pair. So definitely good compensation. And uh, another position where I personally would prefer black. Well, the computer says it's, it's pretty close to even. So if white wants to avoid that particular position, they don't have to play f4 here. I also looked at a5, and a5 makes sense because black is actually threatening to play b5. I mentioned this many times already, that white probably shouldn't be playing a5 unless black is actually threatening to play b5 for real, uh, which he really is threatening to do it here. So a5 now is logical so that they can on passant. And uh, yeah, rook takes which still black shouldn't be too upset, even though, like usual, we, we ruined our structure this way. We got some isolated pawns, but our rook is really good, and uh, we have active pieces. Like, all of, all of black's pieces are pretty good, and that's what, that's what you need in a Benoni. You need to have active pieces. You can't, uh, you can't like, sit around with pass, passive play, and you'd rather, like, your pawn structure's a little bit bad, but you have active pieces. That's what you want. That's what you're going for that active, uh, active compensation for a bad pawn structure. So yeah, I didn't think that black was in too much trouble in this rook e1 variation. We were just playing normal moves, knight e5, rook b8, and c4. c4 is a good move there, definitely. So those were some of the main lines. I mean, also white can play h3 or rook a3, but those could, I mean, h3 could even transpose. But f4 is the most logical move. Obviously, it stops knight e5 and prepares to play e5 for white. So that's what white wants to do, and it makes a lot of sense to, to go for it here, as Navarra does. And I, th and I think it's the most common move, even, which uh, stands to reason. So here I gave a couple of options for black. Geshemov played rook b8. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, I also looked at the move c4. Yeah, I like to play c4 in this variation, I noticed. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one is that it opens up this diagonal, which is pretty nice, towards the king. And also, we're sort of like stopping white from just playing knight c4 and, and clamping down on the queen side. Even though c4 is like a pawn sacrifice, 
um, white actually does better to not accept it. Uh, here's a couple of variations I looked at. Let's look at, first of all, knight takes, which is the worst for white. It looks like white could win a pawn here, but not quite. We'll trade these pawns, and you can't even take on d6 because it's fork town again, winning a piece for black. So that's, that would be like, if you ever get this position in blitz, you might win some games that way just right off the bat. So knight takes is bad. I mean, you could play knight takes c4 without playing knight takes d6, but you wouldn't want to play knight takes c4 and just trade those two pawns away. That, that wouldn't make any sense for white to do that. I also looked at bishop takes c4, which uh, after knight c5, black is, is doing very well. Obviously, the e-pawn is under pressure, and then this was basically the point of sacrificing the pawn. It's a clearance sacrifice. Get out of the way for knight c5 so we can target this pawn. And even if you end up defending that pawn, you know, with a move like, let's say, queen c2, sort of a passive move, you still, like, you won't be able to move your knight away from d2. And that'll cross up your plan of playing knight d2 to c4, which is the whole point of white playing this variation. Um, and yeah, we got a great square for our knight on c5. Um, we're putting pressure on e4. We can still play, like, for example, try to play rook b8 and, and play b5 still, bishop d7. And uh, yeah, get a lot of compensation for the pawn. Computer even said black was better here. So, you know, you always like to see that in a Benoni because usually it says white's better. <laughs> so if it says black's better, you know you're in great shape because you can even stand some positions where it says white's a little bit better. So um, this shouldn't be too much of a problem in that case. And, uh, oh, I, I should also mention briefly that you don't really have to worry about b4 in case you were wondering because then our bishop will be uh, terrorizing your dark squares. So, yeah, any knight move would be kind of devastating there. Um, so that's why white does better in this exact position to not take on c4 and instead play either king h1, which is the move that I think is the most common move in this exact position. Um, I was also looking at e5 because I always want to look at e5, right? You know, you got to worry about e5 if you're a Benoni player. And the point of e5 in this exact position is to remove the pawn from e4. So when you take here, we can take on c4, and you can't take this pawn because we played e5. So this is obviously really messy and complicated. I had to rely heavily on the engine for this variation. It wanted knight b6, logical move. I'm happy to trade the knights and also to attack d5. f takes e5 was the computer recommendation. And knight f takes d5. You could also play knight g4, but I thought knight f takes d5 made a lot of sense. And um, yeah, I mean, black didn't lose a pawn, so that's a good start for black. And again, all of black's pieces have good squares to move, um, so black should be relatively satisfied with this. You could even say black has a better pawn structure here. Um, I don't really know what white got out of this position, but uh, computer doesn't hate it for white. So, you know, if you're playing white in this variation, you could go for this. But if black knows what they're doing, it should, it's, this is just fine. I mean, there's, there's no problem for black here at all. Um, yeah. Knight g4 also is an interesting move there, like I mentioned. So... Anyways, like I was mentioning, those, those options are playable. King h1 is the most common move. Gets out of the way of this check. And so these variations where I'm playing queen b6 check and winning like the knight on d6, for example, uh, they're not playable, of course. We'll still play knight c5. That's the point of playing c4. e5. Yes. Takes, takes. Sort of a pawn sacrifice, but we win it back. Rook e8. More people actually play rook f5 here. There are some games here, believe it or not. Uh, but rook f5 was met strongly by bishop f4, avoiding the trade. And, and your rook on f5 looks pretty weird. So you, you probably don't want that situation. So you just back it up. No problem. I took this a little bit further. Bishop g5. This pin is kind of annoying. Let's kick it. And knight c e4, this is the computer recommendation. Which again, this variation is pretty sharp, so you have to rely on the computer a bit to, um, to survive it. 
But yeah, I think that Black is pretty happy. I mean, still, Black's got technically a better pawn structure, but most importantly, has room for all the pieces. The bishops, the knights, they're all active. And if this pin ever gets like to where you can't stand it, you can, oh, like this, I mean, of course, then you can throw in a quick g5 to get rid of it. Yeah, but we can stand it for now, so it, it's no problem. But just in case they start to put a lot of pressure there, we can throw in a quick g5, it's no problem. And yeah, they have a passed pawn, but we can, we can target it. And I think like, for example, anybody who's played like a Grunfeld with black wouldn't mind this position at all uh, as black. You know, any Grunfeld player would be like, yeah, pass D pawn. What are you going to do? Grunfeld life. Hashtag Grunfeld life. So all these variations with C4 are working out pretty nicely. And I, and I think C4 is an instructive idea in, in this particular, this knight D2 variation. Uh, sometimes it's sacrificing a pawn and sometimes it was tactically winning back the pawn. But we're getting that C5 square for the knight and we're not letting them clamp down on our position, because you, you need to have good squares for all the pieces. I keep you know, harping on that, but that's really what you want. You want your knights and bishops to be active. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're gonna be in some trouble. So c4 is, is a definitely more than playable move. Um, he goes for rook b8, also fine. But you're gonna have to be okay with actually a piece sacrifice here if you play rook b8. And that's why I was looking at alternatives, because not everybody likes to be a piece down. No, I know, I know I don't, but, well, you're going to have to be okay with sacrificing some material if you're a Benoni player, you know, whether it be a, maybe a pawn or, or a piece for two pawns. Like, like, for example, we saw in the G3 variation in part two, we saw that, uh, that, that black is almost forced to sacrifice a piece in that line. So, yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. Here, Navarra plays... A5, which I think A5 is just not a great move. Um, like I said, you should only play it if black is really threatening to play B5, which uh, he's not. Well, actually, maybe he could, because the knight is sort of on the e-pawn here. Uh, let me see. B5 takes, takes. If bishop takes, yeah, maybe we could play some knight E4, huh? Well, anyways, you could at least play queen C2. But uh, no, no, that, that, that ends up working out for white. In fact, I remember because king h1 is the most common move and probably the best move. And I remember you couldn't play b5 because we can just take it and then take with the bishop. And then if you try to like do this, we can throw in bishop takes here. I should have kept this variation because I remember I looked at it. But anyways, we can, we can play my favorite move, right? c4. <laughs> Explosive move there. And I uh, keep coming back to it. But yeah, this is actually the, the main line of, of this knight d2 variation, is king h1 on, on move 13 here. Like I said, Navarro didn't do that. And then c4 as the response. But here's where we have to sack a piece. If they play e5, the only playable move is b5. Yeah, just sack the piece. They'll win your piece. And now your piece down, um, which it seems pretty risky because you only got one pawn for it, which is not a lot of pawns. It's, it's a, a, a lot of material that you've lost. Um, but what did you gain out of it? Well, you got in b5, which is really nice. And their e5 break is gone. They got e5, they won a piece, but now they're not doing anything else. Although winning a piece is pretty good. <laughs> but basically you got rid of their dynamic play and you activated your own play on the queen side. And you're also sort of crossing up this knight idea because their knight can't move anymore. I mean, they can go back, but then they've wasted some time playing knight f3 to d2 and then back. So you're gaining time and you're gaining a strategic element of your two against one play on the queen side, which that should be how black proceeds from this position. But you are a piece down, you know, so you've got actually a lot of good going for you, but it costs you basically a piece for just one pawn. And surprisingly, the computer doesn't hate this at all for black. Um, it says that, you know, it's less than half a pawn advantage for white, which is, is I would say, pretty, it's boding well for, it, it would make me optimistic as black because, you know, you're down a piece for just one pawn and, and it doesn't give that big of an evaluation for your opponent. 
it means you have a lot of compensation. So definitely a sharp and interesting position. Um, it's not to everybody's taste to be down a piece for one pawn, though. So I, you know that's why I recommended, uh, or at least I gave an alternative on move 12 to play c4 uh, instead of rook b8. But Gashimov would definitely have done this, by the way. There's no, there's no other way to go, really. I mean, maybe you can play a move other than c4 here, but after e5, you don't really have a move. You, you got to play b5. And, uh, and go for this position. So I think Gashimov would have done this, I'm almost 100% sure, if Navarra had played king h1 on move 13. Um, but Navarra, he plays a5. I don't know if Navarra was avoiding that, like he knew that variation and is avoiding it. It should be pretty weird, um, because, yeah, I don't think that he's better after a5, as we'll see. Um, or maybe he just didn't know that much, but that's a little surprising, because we're only on move 12, and Gashimov's, Gashimov plays the Benoni all the time, so it's not like he surprised you by playing the Benoni. And Black has played, since the Benoni started, Black's played every most common move, uh, you know, since knight d2. So it's not like Gashimov played a weird thing and Navarro shouldn't know it. It's basically the main line of Navarro's preparation. Um, so I think that he did know that king h1 was the most common move and was avoiding that variation. But... Uh, like I said, he didn't really get an advantage here. After b5, takes, knight takes. This is how the game went. You can't take on a6 with the bishop because you'll get pinned and lose material. So king h1 was played. And then c4, the key move in this variation. We've seen it already like five times. Rook a3 and queen c7. So Black is definitely pretty happy with this position. He got in c4, didn't even have to sack a pawn. Uh, he's got room for all of his pieces. I keep saying that, but that's pretty important. He's also prevented e5, and he stopped knight c4. So I would say this is just a success for Black, and I would say that maybe even Black's better. Um, you know, I gave the symbol for counterplay there. So, you know, it's not objectively better, I guess, but... I definitely like to have, would like to have black here, and uh, Gashimov did end up winning the game. Uh, this was, like I said, 2007 Torneo di Capodanno. But uh, all right, that's all I had for this variation. So if there aren't any questions, I'll just uh, move on to the F3 variation. Any uh, objections? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Hold your pieces. All right. Uh, I don't think I added anything, so no. All right, so yeah, this is the only non-Gashimov game that we'll look at for this whole series, and it happened actually at the Gashimov Memorial. So how fitting is that? Um, this was 2019. Ding Liren had white against Grishuk. I had mentioned, we looked last time at a game Grishuk had white, against Gashimov uh, in, in the F3, I mean, I'm sorry, the G3 uh, Benoni. And I mentioned that Grishuk likes to play Benoni structures and, and this uh, sort of, you know, thinking of this game because I'd already prepared it. Uh, so yeah, Ding has white and they actually play a different move order. I would say this is the more common move order to get this variation. D4, Knight F6, C4, and he goes for G6. Um, yeah, c5 would be our traditional, this would be like the most normal way to get, um, like a, a Benoni move order to get f3 Benoni, they'd play it here like this. But it's pretty rare to see that move order at a high level because usually if you're getting this variation, it's because you're playing g6 and trying to play a Grunfeld, which Grishuk would have done, but white can play f3, an anti-Grunfeld move. Which you can still play d5, and it's, uh, you know, sort of a Grunfeld, a neo-Grunfeld, where they take and play e4. The whole point is that you can't trade knights here, like in a normal Grunfeld. So you'll just have to move your knight back to b6. Um, but black has multiple options here, c5 being fitting our... Uh, our, our series, of course, in the Benoni. 
Um, for the record, you know, there's tons of moves that Black can play. Black can just go into a King's Indian defense, a same-ish King's Indian defense, which is totally fine. Or Black could play like Knight C6. I've played that myself, not with great results. Even E6 is a move. It's kind of a weird move, but they, they're just like, I'm going to play E6, D5, because then F3 doesn't look right. Um, I don't know. I never thought that was a good move, but it was really popular for a time. But anyways, that's all outside the scope of our discussion. So we'll do like this. And then, yeah, that's how, that's how they get this position. And here, Grishuk plays e6. There's not really a big difference between playing e6 or bishop g7 first. Um, I had this position multiple times, and I've played bishop g7. I thought we would look briefly at a game that I played against uh, one of my former students, Matt Larson. He played bishop e3 and e6. And here, Matt didn't, he didn't play, uh, he didn't play knight bc3, which is important because he actually brings his other knight over to c3, like this, a4, and knight bd7. And here, Matt played knight a3, which at the time of the game, this was 2011, according to my database, was a novelty. Although the idea isn't exactly novel, he just wants to go to c4, kind of like we saw Navarra attempt in, uh, in the first game today. Um, in, in this game, I played knight e5, which is not the best move. I didn't know what to do, so I just uh, I actually just played you know, what I thought would be okay. Um, I would definitely play knight e8 now, <laughs> a move that we talked about many times already, and it definitely fits in the position. We're just trying to play a quick f5. For example, bishop e2, f5. You could also throw in queen h4 check, which, uh, spoiler alert, Grishuk does a queen h4 check in, in his game against Ding. But, okay, you don't have to. You can play f5, takes, and g takes. I also looked at queen h4 check here. Computer wanted to do this check and then queen b4. <laughs> never really seen that maneuver before. Never seen that maneuver queen b4. <laughs> a little pun there. But, uh, Seems like a really weird square for the queen. I, I wouldn't necessarily want to do this, but computer says it's, it prefers it, actually. Anyways, you could just take back and knight e5. By the way, we, we definitely do want to take with the pawn uh, and not like the bishop or rook because we want to control that e4 square. Don't want to let the guy play knight e4. That would be a really good knight. So we want to avoid that. And yeah, this type of position is, is just totally fine for black, even though black's got typical bad pawn structure. It's all about that piece activity. I can't stress that enough. You want to have active pieces, and black's got active pieces here. Um, again, you could sort of say that the knight on e8 is not great, but um, a quick knight c7, we could try to get in b5, especially if they play knight c4, which they don't want to do here because we could trade knights, and we're always happy to trade um, get off some of those pieces when we have a lot less space. So, yeah, this would be totally fine for uh, Black to play this way and, and would be an improvement over my, my play against Matt Larson. Although 95 is not too bad. I should be a little bit worse, though. Bishop E2 is what Matt played. Still 98 is the move. Like 98, F4, B5 threatening a b4 fork, b fork, takes, 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 it's a pawn sack, but we can, uh, we can sack the pawn. Th this draws the queen away from g4, so we can play knight g4, hooray. So yeah, this is a pawn sacrifice, but black does get some compensation for it. Uh, I wouldn't say that this is as good as the other variation we looked at with that earlier, knight e8, but uh, you could still even play this way. It would have been better than what I did. Where, or I already spoiled this last game. I actually played h6. A suggestion. This is a Spencer suggestion because Mr. Spencer suggested this in the previous game. But I'm not going to play knight h7. I just wanted to play g5. Yes, g5, key move. We talked about that, I think, in both parts um, to control f4 and, and thereby controlling e5. And uh, then you can't play f4, e5 with white which is pretty nice. He still should play f4, 
Matt took it a little bit too solid here, but f4 would have been the right move to uh, make some weaknesses on my king side here. Where my king actually could come under some attack here because he's got a lot of pieces lined up for it. At least I'd have to spend some time defending it. I mean, my h-pawn's hanging, for example. So this would be definitely better for white and something that black could avoid with I already gave two alternatives. He played queen d2, knight h5. Now I'm trying to play f5. And uh, again, he played a little bit too slow. He played rook b1, which is a solid move getting out of the way of my bishop. And he could even play his pawn break b4. Uh, but then I got f5. And I was already doing great in this position. I got to play, later in the game, I got to play f4 and g4. And I crushed him on the king side, which he could have avoided this by playing g4 in this position. He still probably has some advantage here, like g4, h4, getting, taking the reins on the king side himself, where I would have to play a passive move like knight h7, which is not what I want to play, as discussed in the previous game. But my pawn's hanging, what am I going to do? So that would have been, uh, so white could have been better in multiple ways here. But uh, black could improve, too, by playing 98 on move 11 here, or on move 12 after I played 95. So that was just one example of a game that I had here in this variation, and, and a nice idea by, by Matt to play this knight over so he could bring his other knight to c4 in this way. And uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't actually experienced that, although I remember I saw some game in a slightly different variation where white was doing that, um, I think it might have been, it might have been Anand against Gelfand from their World Championship match, but um, hey Spence. I'd never experienced it before. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. It is Anand Gelfand. Also, w when I play f3 against the Benko, mm -hmm. so I take on b5, a6, f3, um, and then it, if they if they don't um, take on I mean, often I play e4 and I, I play the knight a3, knight e2 to c3 also. Mm -hmm, similar. That's, that's a better way to block up the, yeah, otherwise, you know, the, this knight on g1 always has a problem because you can't go to f3, but if you can play knight yes. e2 to e3, that, that takes care of that. Yeah, exactly. That is a problem in the same-ish variation, like same-ish king's Indian or f3 Banco, is that you're not, your king's knight doesn't have a great square. And this is, I'm glad you brought that up because um, this is why black should avoid playing knight d7 early. This is, uh, this is actually pretty important. And a lot of more beginning Benoni players, they don't understand this. But if you play knight d7, it allows them to play knight h3 to f2, which is a good maneuver for that knight. Um, and, and thereby solving one of white's problems, one of the few problems that white has here. So, yeah, you got to watch out. Don't play an early knight d7 in this variation with f3 for exactly that reason. Anyways, uh, Grishuk played an e6 move order. Like I said, it's not much different than playing bishop g7. And Ding did play knight bc3, so he's not playing like we were discussing, knight e2 to, to knight ec3. Takes, takes. Bishop g7. He just plays knight g2. And this should be considered like the main line of the f3 Benoni. And this is, uh, is kind of nice. Grishuk plays a really accurate move order. And I think it's really important to understand what he's going for here. He plays knight d7. He's holding back on castling. He doesn't want to castle early. And we'll see exactly why. Knight g3, h5. This is a very common to see this. Knight g3, h5. We're trying, again, to make the knight on g3 look kind of misplaced, right? And, uh, and uh, harass it a bit, because it doesn't have a great square. Bishop e2. And knight h7. Great move. Yes, not the best square for the knight, but he's preventing bishop g5. This is actually pretty important. The... I guess the old main line, it might still be the main line, but I think knight h7 should be the main line here, is just to castle bishop h7, oh, bishop e3, bishop, I'm sorry, bishop g5, of course. Bishop e3 is also a move. a6 and queen c7. I've had this position as well. In fact, I lost a game against 
uh, Kostya Kavutsky here uh, as black. This is there are a lot of Grandmaster games here, like dozens. I mean, dozens of us, dozens. What Arrested Development <laughs> for you? I don't know if anybody. Maybe I'll get some comments in the YouTube about that. But yeah, there are, there are plenty of games here um, with queen c7. I don't love to put my queen on c7, but that was just the line that I knew. And Kavutsky, uh, he won a nice game against me. It was a rapid game. Also, my Matt Larson game, by the way, was a rapid game. I don't know if I mentioned that. So I have a lot of rapid games in a Benoni. But um, he played like, he just played queen d2. He traded off my bishop, and my king was really weak on the dark squares. And then he just, he actually ended up playing this pawn break, I think. And uh, my king just got totally crushed, and I never got in b5. It was sad. It was a sad time for me, I'll have to admit. There are other moves here for black. I gave some other queen moves, queen e8, queen b6, rook e8. But um, queen c7 is the most common. I think black should just avoid this variation. It's a little bit better for white, and black was equalizing the way Grishuk played with knight h7, avoiding bishop g5. And it's a slow move. This is what we were talking about in the last game. It's a slow move to put your knight on h7. But white's going to be doing a lot of maneuvering as well. He already made two moves with this knight, and he'll probably have to move it again. In fact, he does move it again. So this is sort of a slower, more maneuvering variation than a lot of the other lines uh, in a Benoni. So we can take some more liberties than usual. Knight f1 was played. Uh, there are... Other games here I found, one with bishop e3. Uh, <clears throat> the, the problem, well, the point of bishop e3 is to put your knight on d2. Knight f1, and then the knight will reemerge on d2. The problem is that you can't play knight e3, of course, because your bishop's on e3. Castles, knight d2, queen e7. f5 is also playable here, but more people play queen e7 and then f5. But yeah, we're really happy to play f5 as usual, get some counterplay in the center. That's one of the other reasons you play knight h7. It stops bishop g5, and it gets out of the way for f5. So this is totally fine for black. Um, white maneuvered the knight quite a lot and wasted a lot of time in order to get it to d2, which is like not an amazing square. I mean, it, it'll be good if it goes here. So, you know, I guess that, that'll be pretty good. But we can always do the typical stuff like trying to trade it away. You know, I assume they won't let us play b5. If we play a6, they'll play a4. But we can try to trade it away, and white doesn't really want to trade the knights away, so he, he'd have to move it yet again. It's like, how many times are you going to move that knight? But anyways, we got an f5, so, so we already have counterplay, and, and we'll have activity there. Uh, bishop f4 also, we'll look at that briefly. Bishop f4 targeting d6, logical move. Um, there were three moves that I found Grandmasters play. Queen e7, Queen f6, which I thought Queen f6 is a little weird. And knight e5 makes sense to me. Knight e5 makes a lot of sense to me because they can't play pawn to f4 anymore. Right, so it, it, it does seem very logical to do that. But Queen e7 I was equalizing with without too much trouble. Um, there's even another Grishuk game here. We can follow, we're following now Aronian Grishuk from the 2018 candidates. h4. G5. So that's the problem with bishop f4 is it allows g5. But Aronian is like provoking g5, you know, weakening the white squares a little bit. G3 x clam, great move by Aronian. I don't know if this was still his preparation. It could have been. Probably, I would guess it was. But it wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't put it past Aronian to make a well timed pawn break. He's a dynamic player as well. Bishop d7 was what Grishuk did, although g4 is an interesting move the computer liked. Um, but I don't think bishop d7 was bad. You can look at g4 if you want, you know, to play something sharp. Although I guess, you know, it's pretty sharp here too. Just make it as sharp as possible. After g takes, he shouldn't take back though. That was, he should play g4 now for sure. Trying to play uh, perhaps even queen takes. g4, f4, knight f3 check. A fork, so you got to take it. So again, we get the bishop pair for the price of, of a pawn. We will we might lose the f3 pawn, uh, almost certainly actually. But we've got the bishop pair, and we still can play f5. Our bishops look really good. We're also threatening to play b5 here already. 
So they have to sort of be careful about that in case you're like just trying to go win the pawn immediately. We could play b5, b4, target this pawn, and that one as well. So we've got a lot of play here, and we still f5 as well. We have all these ideas, and that's what you want. You want a lot of active ideas. And computer says this is just fine for black, no problem at all. Um, although it's still ex extremely messy, of course. Grishuk didn't play g4 in this position, though. He actually took on h4. But after rook g1, white was better here in Aroni and Grishuk, although they ended up drawing. Again, that was from the 2018 uh, candidates tournament. But yeah, white is pretty solid here, and white can probably play f4 pretty easily, just kick back your knight. And the rook on g1 is good. Um, still messy, you know, still really messy, so it's not like black's dead lost or anything. But you can avoid this and play g4 earlier. That's what Grishuk should have, should have done. Your c4 ideas still work in that, in that line? You mean, uh, like, back here? Well, your bishop's hanging, so you're going to have to deal with that first of all. And, uh, oh, right, right. Yeah, once you do deal with that, then I'll... Well, I guess you could play knight g6. I don't know what he did exactly. But it would be nice if we could get that in. You know, in, in the other variation that we looked at in the first game, my knight was on d7, so I was playing c4 to play knight c5 mostly. Um, so here, c4 doesn't have that exact same idea, but you could still try to play knight d3, yes. But yeah, you got to deal with your hanging bishop, first of all. But anyways, yeah, you can just avoid that by playing, uh, by playing g4 here, or g4 here as well. The g4 move is pretty important here, which it stands to reason because they gave you g5 for a tempo. You can just get a free tempo with g5. You can make, make use of it by, by blasting it open. So that would be the best way to handle bishop f4 in this position. Knight f1 is what Ding played. And both players, uh, th this, this game, the Ding Lirin game against Grishuk happened after the Aronian game. So I'm sure Ding knew that game and uh, was, was playing differently probably thought it would equalize or just trying to get Grishuk something he didn't know. Grishuk threw in the check. I'd mentioned that he did this. And then g3. A computer is actually recommending king d2. In case, in case you don't believe me, just put this on your engine. It'll say king d2. But I didn't really look at that because, kidding me, who's, who's going to do that? <laughs> That's ridiculous. So g3, queen e7. So he provoked g3, got you there. And just played queen e7 anyway. So it's kind of nice. Knight e3 castles. He went for a4. Knight e5. And castles. I was looking at h3 to try to play f4. It is a little weird to play h3, g3, and f3 for the record. You don't normally do that. Here's where uh, Mr. Spencer had it right. c4. They're stopping us from playing knight g4, so we got to try to get knight d3 in. Um, this is also, you can also take, uh, it's a pawn sacrifice again, you could take on c4 here. Um, for example, also f4, I can, we can look at that. Obviously, you're popping into d3, sacking a pawn. But this is, I would say, already good for black. Yeah, in fact, I gave the black was much better here because uh, white's position is terrible. He pushed too many pawns. He can't castle because his h pawn's hanging. We're probably just going to win this pawn back immediately. I mean, how are you going to defend it? You're going to do this? <laughs> I'd love to see that. I dare you to do that. Ridiculous. So, yeah, this variation just doesn't even make sense for white to play f4 here. And in, in this way, c4 is kind of refuting that move. But it still is a pawn sacrifice you could take here and win the pawn this way. But then here comes our favorite pawn break, f5. And, well, you can tell that black has a serious amount of compensation. Um, so much pressure in the center. The safer king. I mean, white's king on e1 looks pretty silly. I would generally say that, I mean, if I didn't look at a computer evaluation, I would think black is close to winning. But I think the computer evaluation was close to, to even, actually. It's a little surprising. In a lot of different Benoni is Emery Tate like to play queen h4 to g3 uh, queen h4 to e7 like in this game to provoke mm -hmm. e3 and yes one of the variations was when 
white plays like f4 really early and bishop mm -hmm. check yeah yeah definitely definitely like we talked about that in, in the first check. part actually yeah and force force those white pawns up and force those weaknesses yeah this looks really silly here in fact it was even preventing white from castling in that other variation because we have g3 you can't castle now because then your pawn would be hanging so yeah, provoking that g3 move is, is really smart for whether you're Emery Tate or Grishuk. Anybody can do it. So anyways, Ding didn't play h3, didn't want to push all his pawns. He castled. But then we still get h3 here for our bishop. This is already a success for provoking g3. If, if we get a good square for our white square bishop, we're usually pretty happy because that bishop is often just stuck on c8. So now that it's it's on an active square, already a success. Rick A, E8. And uh, yeah, we could keep going a little bit further here because this was pretty interesting. Um, some tactics sort of erupted or potentially could have. Uh, Ding played bishop d2, good move. This is like classic Ding, as solid as possible here. Uh, you might think, oh, f4 looks pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely, you could consider it because knight g4 hangs upon like this, check, bishop e3, could also play king h1, but anyways, it's a pawn down, but we can play knight f6, and we're going to get counterplay against the e4 pawn. Queen h3, we can just take it and take on e4, which even though we gave up our favorite dark square bishop, now our knight is our favorite. <laughs> knight on e4 is amazing. We can play f5. Um, we do have some long-term weaknesses on our king side, but we won back our pawn, and we have a great knight, and computer just says dead equal. Again, this looks like no problem, in my opinion, for black at all here. Uh, not that this was entirely forced variation. You could probably put your queen somewhere else, but yeah, it, it's no problem. We can handle f4 is my point. We could play knight g4 and, and potentially win back the pawn on e4, which is why Ding played bishop d2. But now they both made a small mistake. Uh, Grishuk played a6, where he should play knight back to f6. And this allows f4, actually f4 is good here, although Ding didn't believe it and played rook a3. But if we look at f4, we'll notice that we'll, we'll do all the same stuff, right? All the same stuff we just looked at, give him a check. Here we'll play, we'll actually definitely play king h1 because we want our bishop on d2. This is the difference, Ding played bishop d2. So now when we go for this variation and we take on c3, like we did the last time, he'll take with the bishop instead of the pawn. And now we can't even take the pawn because it's mate here, because our bishop's here instead of a pawn. So this is kind of like, uh-oh, this is just terrible. Like This is lost. Lost the pawn and gave up the dark square bishop. So bishop d2 that Ding played, oh, by the way, you don't have to take, you could play this, but even still, it's not going to be great. My point is, though, that bishop d2 uh, prepared to play f4 in this way, because this variation with bishop takes c3, we take back with the bishop on c3. But the players didn't figure that out, and instead he just played like a normal solid move with uh, rook a3. Also, queen c7 isn't best. You should play queen d7 here to, again, control g4. But both players, they didn't really believe f4. You know, so he did play queen c7 instead. But yeah, queen d7 would have equalized and, and not been bad for Grishuk. Grishuk did end up losing this game, um, although I don't think that his opening play was bad. Obviously, stuff got messier in the middle game here, as we already saw. Um, because, for example, after Ding's bishop d2, you should just play knight f6. Uh, again, controlling g4 is key, so f4 doesn't uh, doesn't win a pawn anymore. But uh, all right, that's all I had for the f3 variation. And that'll conclude our series on the modern Benoni. We looked at mostly Gashimov games, one non-Gashimov game, but it was actually in the Gashimov Memorial, so pretty fitting. And uh, hopefully in the future, I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to have more series like this. So uh, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to... Uh, keep your eyes peeled for, for future opening series like, like this modern Benoni. And uh, anyways, that's all I have for you today. 
If you enjoyed, please consider to leave a like and subscribe to the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta's YouTube. Thanks. Bye-bye.